Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, December 11th, and we will hear the presentation incorporating sea level rise into a capital facilities plan or capital infrastructure plan. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. We'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. And I'll ask uh, just for my sake that uh, if you please list which panelist you would like to answer the question. That just helps me at the end when we're getting a bunch of questions in all at once. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored by the HMDR uh, Planning Division, Hazard Mitigation, and Disaster Recovery Planning Division, HMDR. Uh, so thanks to you for, for joining us today and for providing great content all throughout this year. We appreciate you. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our final webcasts for 2020. Believe it or not, we're already booking well into 2021. <clears throat> Head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast, excuse me. And you can register for all of our sessions and uh, see what kind of upcoming sessions we have available. So be sure to head over to our webcast webpage to register for everything. Today's webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. For those that need to log those AICP CM credits, just head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account. And from there, you can search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcasts. Make sure you like us on Facebook. Just search planning webcast series and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important information like date or time changes, or even when we have new sessions available for you to register for. So be sure to like us on Facebook. And we record all of our sessions and we post them on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and we'll pop up along with our over 300 videos. We have over 3,100 subscribers, so be sure to join us and you'll get notified when we post a new video. Uh, that is it for my housekeeping items. Again, type those questions in the chat box for me and we will answer those at the end during the Q&A. I am now going to turn it over. Here we go. To Nicole Fagan, who is going to kick us off. Nicole, I just sent those controls over to you. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to APA Ohio for sponsoring this, which is the fourth in our series of webinars on sea level change on and the series this one focuses on infrastructure sea level change and infrastructure thank you all for joining us today first a shout out to the apa hazard division it's one of the newer divisions uh, but it's really very broad geographic reach we are reach over 1400 members 49 states and uh, 29 countries. And the division is focused on advancing the role of planners in hazard mitigation and discovery and adaptation efforts. Planners, as planners, we have a major role to play in to, to build long-term community resilience because our work really dictates where and how communities have to build back and to grow. And that means that we are the ones who are helping to reduce risk by not putting people or infrastructure or other lifelines into dangerous areas. So on the screen, you'll see an email address. If you want more information or you would like to join the chapter, the division, excuse me, go ahead and make a contact there. So today's webinar, we're, it's part of this four part series addressing sea level change relevant that's relevant for shoreline planners and coastal planners across the country. Our first webinar on February 28th addressed covering uh, sea level rise and using best available science, how science is, it can be used in the planning and policy. Our second webinar on May 8th addressed how to integrate sea level rise into different plans. And then the third webinar that was October 3rd addressed coastal hazard zones, best management practices, permitting and planning. 
And the great thing is that if you missed all of these, as Christine said, all of these are now located on the Planning Webcast Series YouTube channel. So you can go back and see all of those. So before we get started, let me introduce the, your hosts for this whole series. I'm Nicole Fagan. I'm a coastal management specialist with Washington Sea Grant in Seattle, Washington, where I help coastal shoreline and uh, shoreline and coastal planners find solutions for complex shoreline and coastal management issues, including, for example, how to incorporate sea level rise into various planning processes. I'm going to be joined in a little bit by my co-host, Matt Campo. He is a research associate, the research specialist with the Edward Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. And Matt provides analysis and support for federal, state, and local agencies to, in, in, to enhance environmental planning capabilities and resilience strategies uh, for coastal communities. So in today's webinar, the fourth in this series, we are going to explore sea level rise and infrastructure planning from the perspective of a planner. So in some cases, planners are really an integral part of the, cap, of the capital infrastructure planning process. And uh, under these types of systems, for example, a planner can be an important part of actually the design and the implementation and deciding the prioritization of selecting projects, et cetera, that are included in the plan, in the capital improvement plan. In other jurisdictions, though, though the planner is not central, but may have a role in influencing how sea level rise could be in, incorporated into the CIP process. So our presenters today are going to provide us with two different approaches. We're going to look at approaches from Olympia, Washington, and from Monroe County in Florida. And we'll start first, though, with an update on, about a recently released report from APA, the Planning Advisory Service Report 596, that on planning for infrastructure, infrastructure resilience. And finally, we'll have Q, open Q&A with our panelists to ask further questions. So please remember to enter your questions in the chat box and we may have time as we're going along to address a few questions for each of the panelists as, and then we'll have a for, more formalized Q&A with some questions that we've prepared, et cetera, at the end. But let's go back first and do a quick review of what we covered in, the first, in our first webinars. In the first one, we covered what are the components of sea level change, melting sea ice sheets, thermal expansion that is exacerbated by greenhouse gas. And we talked about the differences in, between scenario and probabilistic models of sea level rise. And then we looked at an example in state of Washington where they we've developed localized projections and how that what that means for planners. And then we also provided a series of tools. And you'll notice at the bottom of each of these slides, I have listed where these are found on the YouTube channel. What we covered in the second webinar is using sea level change and sea level rise projections in an actual planning process. And we looked at a couple of different examples from different communities. And we found that in some cases, there's coordinated approaches across the state. In some cases, it's by jurisdiction, each one doing its own thing. Others, there's regional coordination. We found that there's just a lot of different approaches that are being applied and also how it's being uh, up, uh, up different approaches about what projections and then differences in how it's being integrated into the planning process. What we covered in our third webinar is using hazard zones to address future conditions. We looked at examples in King County, Washington, New York City, and Norfolk, Virginia, and the presenters discussed how they use the sea level rise projections and data how they then, and using floodplain FEMA maps, uh, using zoning to create zones, and, all, and then using all of that information that they created a map or a zone and to address future flood conditions. So today we're going to turn to sea level rise and infrastructure planning. And here's some of the questions we'll be examining. What kind of planning is being done and where do you begin to address sea level rise? what information is being used, and what's the criteria for deciding 
what should be included in an infrastructure plan as it relates to sea level rise? And then where do planners fit into that picture in different ways? First, uh, I want to introduce you to this APA report. It was released last winter, and this was funded by NOAA, and the Planning Advisory Report 596, which is titled Planning for Infrastructure Resilience. I'd like to really give a shout out to the authors who are from the Association of State Floodplain Man Managers in association with the APA. And specifically, I'd really like to call out Joe DeAngelis, who's a research manager from APA, <clears throat> whose effort, he was the manager of this effort. And he would be here giving this presentation that I'm going to try to stand in for him on. Unfortunately, he tested positive for COVID last week, and so our thoughts are with him for his speedy recovery. Jeff Payne, director of NOAA's Office uh, for Coastal Management, put it really well for this report. He said, with finite resources and escalating risks, communities need to make smart investments to ensure that they can withstand the seas and the storms of tomorrow. We can't afford not to. A capital improvement process provides a good opportunity to chart a new course, including planners at the table with the public work staff, engineers, and elected officials will only help communities move in the right direction. So some of the key findings from the report that were included doing surveys and case studies from across the country what they found were that, first of all, climate adaptation planning doesn't often align with the capital improvement and infrastructure planning. And the planners are often not even involved in the capital improvement planning process. And the communities really vary drastically in how robust or long-term and coordinated their efforts are in relationship to future climate considerations. We've put a link for the report into the chat box, and I encourage you to download that and take a look at it. It's full of a lot of very good information. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some of the information from that report. First of all, talking about some definitions. So what's, what do we mean when we say, what is a CIP, a capital improvement plan? It's a community planning and fiscal management plan used to coordinate location, timing, and financing of multiple projects over a multi-year period. And an alternative name that we might see and hear is Capital Facilities Plan. This is one that we use in Washington State. Contrast that though to a capital improvement project, which is an individual infrastructure project uh, that is considered annually. So what's, what do we mean when we say infrastructure? It's publicly funded projects, including transportation investments, wastewater, wastewater, coastal, defense, <coughs> coastal defenses, and hazard mitigation structures are all included under that umbrella. All right, I'm going to talk just briefly about what's the what is when we talk about a capital improvement plan, what does that process look like? So first of all, the first step would be you organize the CIP by ad identifying who's going to be involved which departments, <clears throat> which forms, what's, what the schedule is, et cetera. The next step is identifying what projects and funding options are gonna be included in that plan. And then you look at preparing and recommending the, the uh, CIP and it would go to elected officials with projects, plans, timelines, performance indicator, indicators and financing summaries. And then finally, you adopt your capital budget. Once it's been adopted then, it goes into that individual permit project, project process, which is a separate process from what we'll be talking about today. But then the question is, how and where in this whole process do you address sea level rise? And what's the role for planners in all of this? So in the, in the report that was produced by APA, there was four big disconnects that they identified and talk about with between planners, resilience, and infrastructure planning. First of all, disconnect number one, community planners and community planning doesn't really, doesn't 
sometimes doesn't at all overlap with the work of the infrastructure and capital planning. So planning departments may not even be a significant part of a CIP process, or they may be involved, but only at a director level. But meanwhile, you have somebody doing a comprehensive plan or involved in a specific neighborhood, and they are really disconnected from what's going on. Disconnect number two is that climate adaptation planning may not even have any explicit connection with infrastructure planning. That's, that is, it might deal with generalities about the need for resilient infrastructure or, or may identify areas of risk, but identifying some of the climate vulnerability in some specific area may not go anywhere other than identifying that it's vulnerable, which then leads to our next item in disconnect, which is climate adaptation plans are not necessarily at all connected with the infrastructure implementation. No, we're not really addressing implementation in this webinar today, our speakers, which I just want to reference this, but also it's all part of this larger issue and connection of the issue about sea level rise and infrastructure, that what is the role of planners and what are they, what's the role first of climate adaptation and how is that connected at all to a CIP process? What role do the adaptation plans have in requiring that project managers account for sea level rise or even address it, sea level rise or coastal hazards? And then what role does the adaptation plan have in this prior, perhaps a reprioritization or even creating a prioritization of projects that are based on areas that are in a high risk? So the critical question we have to ask is how are we changing our processes so that we can build this adaptation plan process directly into how we prioritize we scope, we're designing, and we're building our capital infrastructure. So disconnect number four then is a big one, which is the issue of climate change science is not necessarily connected to what people are doing as planners in their plans and planning. They And the reasons are varied. They Planners may not have expertise, and they may be overwhelmed with the resources that they have, and they may not even be given any authority or empowerment by their planning directors, by council, to even address any of these issues. <clears throat> there may not be information that's seen as trusted. There may not be a regulatory link that requires any connection. And then there's always the issue of uncertainty and how does that fit into a planning process and how can that information be used? So the planning advisory report identifies these four steps that can be included into the CIP process. For those of you who are adaptation specialists and know about how to do an adaptation plan, you'll say, gee, that looks very familiar. You inventory your infrastructure, you identify your future rust, risk, you determine your exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and timelines of concern, and then you create your plan. But all of this is being done in the report in the context of an infrastructure plan and an infrastructure planning process. So the report goes into quite a bit of detail about each of these steps, how to do it in the infrastructure planning process, what are some of the tools, how do you address regulations, and some of the uh, other issues that need to be addressed to think about how planners can be engaged in the overall the infrastructure project process and addressing sea level rise at the same time. So here, so today what we want to do is address and look at CFPs and sea level rise from two case studies examples. And we're going to look at issues of what are some of the criteria issues. We're going to look at funding and so funding sources. We're, talk, we're going to talk about planning horizons and life cycle. We'll talk about plan coordination and ultimately planning as either a driver or a follower. So with that, I would like to introduce our two guest speakers. First, you will be hearing from Susan Clark. Susan Clark is the Engineering and Planning Supervisor for the City of Olympia, Washington, and she has a degree in urban and regional planning and started her career as a comprehensive land use planner in a Washington county with general use zoning and a voter rejected comprehensive plan. After focusing on drinking water issues in a public works department, at a public utility 
at, at, a, at a water utility and at the state level, Susan now oversees planning and engineering for the city of Olympia's drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater utilities. The next we will be hearing from is, we'll be hearing from Rhonda Haig, who is the sustainability director and acts as the chief resilience officer for Monroe County in Florida. It's located in the, as she says, the fabulous Florida Keys. She's been with the county for nine years and leads the county's resilience and sustainability efforts to help prepare the county and its coastal communities for the efforts of sea level rise in what's probably one of the most vulnerable regions of our county. And to assist in these efforts, Ms. Haig serves as an active member of the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact Steering Committee. Now, before I turn it over, I want to remind everybody, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat box. We'll try to address some of them as we're going along at the end of each of the presentations, and then we'll have a full, more formal Q&A at the end. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, Susan. Welcome. Hi, thank you. And I think I should be able to share now, right? Are folks seeing that? Yep, we see your screen. You just have to put it in the slideshow and you're good to go. All right, is I'm at the end of my slideshow. I'm sorry about that. Now I'm going. Okay, so thank you. First of all, I'm going to just start um, by acknowledging the fact that I don't have a um, particularly sophisticated um, home office. So I am speaking through a small laptop. I don't have fancy heads, headsets and things like that. Um, so I appreciate a little, little grace. The city of Olympia has spent about 18 months or so working with the Port of Olympia and a regional wastewater treatment agency called the Lot Clean Water Alliance. We spent 18 months on a sea level rise response plan for a downtown core. I'm not here today to go over that plan in any great detail, but I do suggest um, visiting our sea level rise response uh, webpage if you're interested in learning more about the response plan. The plan itself is available there. Plus we have a couple story maps that describe how um, flooding happens in the city of Olympia. And we have some climate science review information and our detailed vulnerability and risk assessment. Instead of presenting the plan, I will provide a little bit of background about Olympia, how we plan here in the state of Washington and in the city. And we'll touch on how we involved planners in our sea level rise process and how we are implementing the plan. Just so you have a little context, this particular picture was taken from the state capitol grounds. It's looking down on Capitol Lake and Bud Inlet is out in this area. Downtown Olympia is over in here. City of Olympia is located on Bud Inlet on the southern portion of Puget Sound. It's about 90 miles south of the, uh, Seattle. It's the capital of the state of Washington. It's home to a deep water marine terminal, an environmental college, and has a population of approximately 53,000. A regional wastewater treatment plant that also serves the cities of Lacey and Tumwater, plus the urban area of Thurston County is located in downtown Olympia. 
and we have a very engaged community that first asked the city council how it was addressing global warming in 1990. Our sea level rise response planning efforts are focused on our downtown core. You can see from this map here that much of our shoreline is in public ownership. The Port of Olympia property is in this kind of yellow co color. The location of the regional treatment plant comes up in red. The city of Olympia has a popular waterfront park, including a boardwalk located along the waterfront here. And the state of Washington owns a significant uh, portion of property along uh, Capitol Lake here, shown in orange. And the lake itself was formed many years ago by the damming of the Deschutes River. Over here on the photo, this is the Port of Olympia, Capitol Lake, the Deschutes River goes up off the map. And this area is bed inlet. Downtown is vulnerable to flooding from high tides, high Deschutes river flows, and backflow through our stormwater system. This map here shows our vulnerability to 12 inches of sea level rise. We are taking a phased approach to planning for sea level rise and planning for up to 68 inches by 2100 under our high scenario. The sea level rise response plan includes four different types of adaptation strategies, including physical, operational, governance, and informational. Who is responsible to pay for each and to what level is tied to what asset is being protected. For example, the city of Olympia is planning to elevate its waterfront boardwalk to protect it from sea level rise, but doing so will also help to protect inland properties. Over time, we will have to decide how such mutually beneficial projects will be funded. This is an example of the types of strategies we are contemplating along our shoreline. Depending on location, we might build raised planters, a wall, or install floodgates to protect inland properties. Shown down in this area is some property that is on the water side, so to speak, of the wall of protection. Currently, there is a grocery store and a yacht club. As we were putting together the sea level rise response plan, we had communications with these property owners to let them know we were not planning public infrastructure to protect their property. But we were willing over time to have conversations about joint funding of um, protection. This is an example of the plan's conceptual drawings. It shows the construction of a wall along Capitol Lake. Again, Capitol Lake is under the ownership of the state of Washington. So we need their help to help us to protect downtown. I don't know how true it is, but according to Wikipedia, the Washington's approach to growth management is unique. Under the Washington State Growth Management Act, which was passed in 1990, Olympia is required to prepare a comprehensive plan and show we are implementing it through our capital investments and development regulations. Prior to 2010, the storm and surface water utility started to analyze potential impacts to downtown from sea level rise. In 2010, the Olympia City Council adopted a policy to protect downtown from sea level rise at the request of the Public Works Department. 
That policy was evaluated and confirmed through a comprehensive planning process in 2014. In 2016, we implemented a new development code associated with our downtown properties. Um, new properties being developed in our downtown area must elevate or flood, flood proof to two feet above the 100 year flood plain. Our comprehensive plan really stresses the revitalization of our downtown. And in fact, we are expecting up to 5,000 new residents to live in our downtown core. Um, in 2017, we worked on a downtown strategy um, for specifically for downtown. Again, we emphasize that downtown will be protected from the effects of sea level rise. So how was the plan developed? Because the stormwater utility is responsible for flooding, it led the sea level rise response planning effort. Working across sectional and departmental boundaries is deeply ingrained in our culture at the city of Olympia. So we involved others from throughout the city on an internal work group. This included planners from our planning department, our transportation department, parks, and emergency management. Through our work on our sea level rise response plan, city departments were made aware of which of their assets are vulnerable to sea level rise and when. These are various um, capital assets that are located, located downtown. The first photo shows the location of the Lock Clean Water Alliance treatment plant. Uh, the gray building is their administrative building. I'm getting... City Hall is here at the bottom. I'm getting some messages that folks may not be hearing me very well. Oh, I can hear you fine. Oh, okay, because I'm sorry, I, I'm hesitating because I'm getting a major message that folks aren't hearing me. So I apologize for my no. stumbling here. We hear you. <laughs> so everything's all right? Okay. Yeah, you're you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. All right, so our water related utilities, which are the stormwater utility, the drinking water utility and the wastewater utility, all have management plans that guide our work and they're updated every six years. The capital programs, capital projects that are incorporated into these plans are then incorporated into the city's larger Growth Management Act related um, capital facilities plan every year. And they're reviewed to make sure they reflect the city's land use policies and, and growth objectives. All three address facilities that are vulnerable to sea level rise. The Parks Department is also taking into account sea level rise related to its waterfront park since it is vulnerable to sea level rise in the short term. Transportation and our general facilities department are also incorporating information learned through the sea level rise response plan in their longer term capital plans. This slide contains some high level costs associated with implementing the plan. We assume that a variety of funding mechanisms will be required to implement the physical strategies identified in the plan. Funding may come from a mix of federal, state, county, and city sources. 
Just because the storm and surface water utility has been responsible for the sea level rise response plan, it doesn't mean it's responsible for funding all necessary infrastructure changes. Right now, we are working on a new interlocal agreement to form the Olympia Sea Level Rise Response Collaborative. Initial members of the collaborative will be the partners that developed the Olympia Sea Level Rise Response Plan. And we are also inviting others to participate, including the, the state of Washington. Under the new interlocal agreement, when it's executed, the collaborative will adopt the Olympia Sea Level Rise Response Plan as its strategic plan. And then it will develop a work program that prioritizes implementing the strategies outlined in the plan. Our highest priority will be on focusing um, our efforts on funding, finding funding sources, and um, talking about methodologies, who pays for what to what level, things like that. At this point, I am ready to turn the presentation over to Rhonda. Before you do that, uh, I want to see, thank you, Susan, very much. I really appreciate you giving us an overview. Uh, and for those of us in Washington State, it's been really interesting watching Olympia because they've, as a city, been way ahead of the curve in working on these issues. And for those of you in other parts of the country, Olympia is uh, one of our lowest areas within the Puget Sound area and is already experiencing some extreme flooding. And I think that uh, there, if, there, if anybody has any quick questions for Susan, we have a minute or two before we'll shift over to Rhonda. The one question that did come in, and uh, I apologize uh, for the person who asked this, I'm going to interpret it in a little bit of a different way, but is given all of this is how, how have you incorporated timing and what is the, the, the time, how do you adopt timing into all of that planning process and determine does it, is all of the infrastructure on the same timeline or different? How do you deal with timelines? Here, I'm going to go back just so you can see my one slide with a phased approach concept. So, well, maybe not everywhere, not all portions of our downtown will be impacted at the same time. We are first vulnerable um, from flooding associated with Capitol Lake in, in this area. So we know we need to first address um, Capitol Lake areas around here. Um, and again, this map shows our vulnerability to 12 inches of sea level rise. For example, this area um, making up the Port of Olympia we know this is vulnerable, but not um, until later into the future. So we know we need to first focus our efforts along Capitol Lake and along our waterfront. Um, so we've taken that kind of concept of, of timing into consideration um, because we have studied the way um, flooding will happen within the city of Olympia, the downtown area. So that's one of the ways that we have done it. And so it's not related necessarily to types of infrastructure that you're focusing, say roads compared to outfalls or anything like that. It's more area specific based on having done mapping. And then you look at the map and say, what's going to be in, impacted soonest? We're gonna focus all of our attention on that. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Correct, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, other question, um, how did you, how did Olympia set the estimated six inches in the short term and is there a trend line that says this is enough and of amount to plan for? Hmm. So one of my first reactions uh, to that question is we've been monitoring um, flooding over the years in our downtown and some of the first flooding 
we have been experiencing is associated with um, backup into our stormwater system. So we've been putting um, tide gates in around Capitol Lake, which has really helped us uh, to address some of the, the flooding that we have been seeing in the beginning. Um, that's the first way I, I'm looking to answer that question. Great. So this, but the, and the six inches, did, was that done from the studies that that was the amount? Right. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we should probably move on. If other people have questions for Susan, we'll ca catch those in the Q&A period. So we're going to transfer you over now to Rhonda and go to Florida. Good afternoon. Here you go. Hear me? We can hear you and okay. go ahead and turn your camera on as well so we can see you. Okay. Hi. So I lost Great. my presentation. Give me just a second. This is Rhonda Haig, Chief Resilience Officer. So do you see my presentation now? We do. Okay. So as you said in the beginning, I'm um, in Monroe County, which is in the fabulous Florida Keys, and we're here to talk to you a little bit today about what we're looking at um, in terms of our capital infrastructure plan um, in the Keys. We're going to talk a little bit about where the location is, the background on what we are doing, our local infrastructure adaptations, and the role of planners. And I was glad that I, I heard all of your four um, breakdowns from that report where the um, disconnects happen and it used to be us 10 years ago, but because we are so um, vulnerable to sea level rise and we have so much work ahead of us, I'm happy to say now that I don't think we have any of those four issues anymore, the breakdown points. Basically, everybody in the county is communicating. So, as we said, Monroe County is in the Florida Keys. And um, for those that you aren't aware of this, um, that's a string of islands at the very tip of Florida. And of course, Key West is at the very end. And so these islands are over 100 miles long. Many of them are at or near sea level. Um, and so when you're looking at, you know, potential sea level rise in the future, we are we consider ourselves one of the canaries in the coal mine. We are extremely vulnerable to climate change. And so we've been busy for the last decade doing a lot of research and modeling so that we could get ready for our big infrastructure plan that we're about to implement here after the next year. So what you're gonna to hear today is us talking about our roadway vulnerability study. So we have over 300 miles of county maintained roadways in the Keys. That's just in the unincorporated Monroe. It doesn't count the five municipalities. And you're gonna to hear today how almost half of those roadways are gonna be subject to sea level rise inundation within the next 25 years. And so the purpose of the vulnerability study is to help make the Florida Keys more resilient to sea level rise by um, elevating the roads. And we are looking at all of the island chain from Key Largo to Key West, where there are county maintained roads. And this just shows a little bit of you know, what we're looking at. So why the urgency? First of all, um, I want, you know, we have, we've been in, if you haven't seen this, we've been in the national and international press quite a bit the last couple of years. We already have roads, entire neighborhoods that during the fall king tide season, during October, November, when the, when the tides are the highest, we have neighborhoods that are underwater for up to 90 days. And it's not just ankle length, it can be um, almost knee length. So this one here is in Key Largo, they were under 82 um, days continuously, and that's salt water. And we were having issues even with our general services like the mail getting through or ambulances and police. And so it's a very serious problem. And we saw it coming. Um, and so we've done been doing a lot of planning behind the scenes, but that doesn't mean that we are where we exactly should be right now. We should be actually elevating roads and we're not quite there yet. So here again are some additional pictures of what roadways look like here. Um, this is again, that's on uh, Key Largo neighborhood, another one. Um, and this is in Big Pine Key, the poor deer walking down the, um, the street. So these are what we are already seeing here in the Keys. And because we are an island community with very low geography and a lot of you know, bridges and islands, we're one of the third, um, we're the third most vulnerable in the um, nation. And if we don't do anything, 
um, you know, to raise roads or prepare ourselves, 36% of our population will be displaced by the year 2060. So that's a lot. So we're a very low, um, we only have 75,000 people in our county, but thanks to many of you on the line who come visit us, we do have, um, you know, a couple million, more, maybe more than a couple of million come visit us every year. So we want to maintain, the, you know, our people that are able to live here, and we also want to maintain our resilience so that we can continue to have our visitors come visit us. And again, these are just some additional pictures of what these king tides look like. So back in 2015, that was when it really, um, so it's been happening for many years, but back in 2015 is when it really seemed to get out of hand and when neighborhoods started going under many inches of water for weeks, days or weeks at a time. So that's 2015, 2016. This is last year, 2019. Can you imagine driving down that road in that vehicle? I mean, it was almost a foot, over a foot deep. Um, for for weeks at a time. So you can see our problems here. We have to really get moving and determine what we're going to um, do here with these roads because we cannot, uh, residents cannot, um, you know, continue to live on in, in circumstances like that. So as I said, we've been at it for a decade already. Um, back in 2016, we launched our five-year, um, what's called the Green Key Sustainability and Resilience Plan. So it wasn't just a plan, kind of like I heard her talking earlier. It was a five-year, 100 five-year um, work plan with 165 different projects. And it included projects for all the departments within the county, engineering, you know, environmental planning, and it was all a work to, to coordinate together to help make the county more resilient as a whole. And as we work through some of these issues and figure out what, you know, what um, areas need to be changed, that's when we start adopting amendments to our comprehensive plan based on the data. They've included some other things like road pilot road elevation projects, improving our elevation, elevation data of the streets, and including an engineering um, analysis of the countywide road study, which is a little bit what we're going to talk about today. Then we also passed back in 2016 an energy and climate element of our comprehensive plan to help the county be more um, sustainable overall and help our departments um, work towards implementing that um, amendment. And again, our pilot road elevation projects, I'm not gonna get into a lot of that. And then of course, we keep continue to um, apply for sea level rise planning grant. So that's what we've done today. We've done an awful lot of planning to help us get up to the big infrastructure stuff. And then in planning, in process right now is this countywide roads adaptation plan where we're looking at 300 miles of county maintained roads and we're identifying the sea level rise impacts to roads. And so when you're looking at raising roads, one might think, oh, we're only gonna look at the amount of sea level rise that's gonna be on a road. But if you do that, what might happen is you might um, rank the roads, if you just rank them according to the amount of water that's gonna be on them, there might be some of those roads where maybe perhaps not a lot of people or a lot of activity is, is occurring. And so you'd be spending money on elevating roads where you're not gonna get a lot of bang for your buck. And so that's why when we were in the middle of this, we're in the middle of this right now, we definitely brought in our planners, our whole planning team actually, to help us identify what this ranking criteria should be based on growth and environmental and community factors so that it was gonna be sure that it was gonna be well planned out and that we were gonna get um, a very well thought out plan. And then we identify the policy options and I'll get into that a little bit later on. But for instance, like if we not able to afford to elevate all of the roads in the Keys, then we have to start making policy decisions. Okay, which ones aren't we gonna, aren't we potentially not gonna elevate? And if we do that, are we gonna have to abandon them? Or you know, what are the policy implications and we're anticipating a lot of policy implications, believe me, where we're gonna then perhaps have to amend our comprehensive plan to go along with what we can afford to do um, in terms of um, capital implementation. And so our vulnerability assessment, um, we're also looking at other things in terms of, you know, not just looking at roads, we're looking at the environment and our buildings and everything else. And then finally, um, in processes are comprehensive. We're doing a big plan update right now with our peril of flood amendments. We're um, looking at adaptation action areas. With those of you not from Florida, that was a, a, um, a thing approved by the Florida, um, a, the statute um, several years ago, where we're, if your county wants to go ahead and amend their comprehensive plan to add in what's called adaptation action areas, they're kind of like set aside areas, and I'll get into that a little bit more, for sea level rise planning, and then other amendments as necessary. So that's kind of where we are in process. 
Now, I was kind of happy to see um, the previous presentation because they had very similar water um, levels anticipated. So we're anticipating in the next 25 years, another 13 inches um, rise in sea level rise, then by 2060, another 11, and then another 43 for a total of almost um, five feet, a little over five feet by the year 2100. So that's an awful lot of water. I call it a wall of water. So we have to plan um, if we want to remain resilient in the county. And that's what this project is about. This can show you one neighborhood. This is one in Key Largo, what it could look like if we don't do anything. So the year 2035, we're already seeing water encroach on the roadway year round. Year 2045, you can now see additional two and a half feet of water on the roadway. And then by 2060, you can see um, it's totally inundated and going into houses. So this is not an acceptable format. So we wanna make sure we can move forward with the proper plans to try to avoid situations like this. And so when we're looking at, I said, we have 300 miles of county roadways. So the study has already shown um, that 152, basically half of those roads. So half of our roadways are gonna be subject to sea level rise in the next 25 years by the year 2045. And then by 2060, just you know, another few years after that, 66% of our roadways. And then you can see here, just let me move my, oops, hang on here. And then down, you know, by the 2060, you can see. So a lot of things. And then to get us just to the year 2045, we're looking at approximately 1.8, probably more like $2 billion to elevate those half of the roads that are gonna be subject to in, um, inundation. So a very big upcoming capital infrastructure plan. And again, 49%. And that 49% of the roadways actually encompasses 71% of the residential units. So that's why how planning got involved. They, when you know we said we can't just look at roadways, we have to look at people too. So what is vulnerability? So when you're looking at just vulnerability, you're looking at basically what's caused by the environment. That can be a lot of things like sea level rise. And then when we, we look at the second part, we look at criticality, which I call the people factor. It's what, how is that road critical and how are humans using it? Are there fire stations or hospitals? Is it an evacuation route? How many people are on it? So these are the two sets of criteria that we looked at um, as we're developing our roadway elevation capital infrastructure plan. And so again, the vulnerability assessments, I won't get a lot into these, but includes things like groundwater clearance. So as the levels of sea continue to rise, your groundwater continues to rise. And we already see a lot of water bubbling up. We have a very porous geography in the Keys. We already see a lot of water bubbling up um, quite a few places. It also includes surface inundation, um, storm, surface wave impact. So, you know, we, we don't have a lot of that in the Keys because we're so shallow, but, you know, we do have to look at surface wave impact and then um, elevation. And this is what it could potentially, well, does look like here in the Keys. So we looked at just an example. So here by the year 2025, 20, um, you can see even on the King Tides, we have sea level rise coming up to the sides of the road. And then next, you know, that, 25 years after that, you can see we're now looking at year, not year round sea level rise, but sea level rise now coming up to the side of the road. And during October, November, you have king tides over the entire road. And then by 2060, you can see it's, it's um, over two feet. So these are why we have to move forward with um, implementation plans now so that we can prepare for this. Because when you're looking at elevating 150 miles of roads, that takes quite a bit of time to do that. And so then the step two is that other set of criteria. And this is really where the planners really help come in and help us identify what they were. So we took that vulnerability score from what you just saw, then we added it into the number of residential units, critical facilities, um, number of commercial buildings. Can't forget the habitat down here. We're in a National Marine Sanctuary, so we have to look at the habitat, wetlands, and then um, finally um, clearance of um, critical evacuation routes. And so we put these together. And so you looked at a step one here where we took just the vulnerability of factors. And again, this is where the planners helped us identify. You know, we first we had all of these equal weighting percentages, but then the planners come in and helped us decide how they should be um, distributed based on you know our needs here in the county. So we these top two here were the top two, 60 and 25 percent, and then we included the rest but much lower levels. Then we took that score moved it over to the criticality evaluation factors, and then added this in, all these in, and that's how we ranked our roads now. We use these two sets of criteria, 
built into one. And the planners were very, very helpful. Uh, we could not do this with just engineering or plant, you know, uh, sustainability staff. The, the planners were really in, instrumental in helping us figure out the ranking criteria. And this is really how now we're going to rank our roads, all 300 miles of roads, and how they're going to get elevated. It was using this criteria. And so the process was just a really quick here, I won't get into a lot of it. So we collected all the data that we've been doing for the last 10 years. We asked the planners to come in and work with the engineers to get the criteria. The next step is now it's going into a engineering concept where they're gonna design several variations of what road elevations will look like. It's not gonna be the same. We're expecting very different types of road elevations throughout the keys because they're so different, you know, hundreds of miles apart. And then again, with the planning input, we're gonna to have to look at, well, what can we afford? What's gonna be our level of service? Are there still gonna be some water on the road or we can, or not? And uh, we'll look at affordable housing issues and staging efficiency and all these other factors that planners are gonna help with. And then finally, a year from now, when we get through with all the engineering design, we bring it back for a final um, adaptation plan. And that's why really, when we look at the policy issues about what we can afford, you know, can we afford that $2 billion and if not, that's when we're gonna to have to make some policy decisions with the planner's input. So a very complicated process as it, as it should be when you're spending $2 billion of public funds on elevating roads that you have to make sure you dot your T's and, or dot your I's and cross your T's. And so we're also doing um, comprehensive plan updates here in the Keys. We added, added an energy and climate element to help the county be more sustainable. We're updating our parallel flood elements now, which will be finalized in our evaluation and appraisal report. We're doing an overall integration of sea level rise into other comp plan elements. We're working on that right now. And then finally, our stormwater um, management regulations. So we're here in the Keys. We're just in the middle of this big, big push to move forward with resilience planning and, and capital planning. And then future, um, comprehensive plan, you know, the countywide throat study be, bigger, ends in another year. We're looking at um, this adaptation action areas I talked a little bit about earlier. We're also looking at our assessment of our shorelines. We have hundreds of miles of shorelines and how we're going to harden those. And remember, we're in a National Marine Sanctuary, so we cannot build seawalls around everywhere. It just doesn't work here in the Keys. We look at our growth, our development rights, our framing of our infrastructure commitments, and finally our land acquisition. And we put all of this together into our plans, our capital plans for how we're gonna spend our money and where it best be spent. And then of course, maintaining access for recreation and disaster recovery. We can't forget that, that's also very important. Then our planning decisions to help move our roads and implementations that we have a framework for adaptation approaches, we look at growth, you know, where is likely the future growth gonna be? Should we concentrate our road elevation growth in those areas or not? We look at the different levels of service. Are different areas gonna have different levels of service? And we probably think that they will just because we can't, probably not gonna be able to afford to elevate all the roads for equal a level of service. Um, so some neighborhoods might have more water on the roads that's typical at some um, times of the year versus other um, neighborhoods. And that's probably gonna be tied to the number of people and whether it's an evacuation route and all that kind of stuff. And we also can have to continue to do our road maintenance. We can't forget that. And then finally, our implementation strategies under a comprehensive plan. So it's all gonna to work together into um, a future plan. And so what we're looking at is, you know, we look at the countywide adaptation, what we're doing in terms of roads. We already elevate all of our buildings now, any county buildings, we elevate them high enough so that in 50 years, the bottom of that, the, the floor of that building will not be wet. So like fire stations, we elevated this one, I think about six feet above ground to make sure that it would be around for a long time. And then we look at private property responses, and this is really gonna be contentious here in the Keys. Are we gonna allow people to fill in their lots? Because just because we're elevating roads doesn't stop the water from coming in the private yard. So we're gonna to have to work together with the residents on determining what we're gonna help allow and help do with the private. And then together, that's how we're gonna achieve resilience by working countywide with private property. And again, gonna how are the communities are implementing resilience. We're looking at our comprehensive plan for public roads, um, their LDRs, and for private property. Again, you're gonna to have to amend your comprehensive plan as to what you're gonna allow in terms of fill-in. And then public floor property, you look at your available lands for road adaptation and how you're gonna be able to use those. And that concludes my presentation. 
So thank, thank you. I appreciate that, Rhonda. What do I do now? Oh, so we're going to have you. We're going to just have you go ahead and transfer it over to me. And then I'd like to introduce my co-host, Matt Campo. Welcome back, Matt. And he's going, I think we might, there may be a question or two for you, Rhonda. And then what we're going to do is we have some questions for both you, uh, both Rhonda and Susan. And we'll bring Susan back up as well. And then uh, we'll also be monitoring the chat box for your questions from the audience. So go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks everybody for uh, attending and spending your Friday here with us today. So Rhonda, one uh, quick, there, there were two quick questions, I think, and then some others that were related to broader themes. One is uh, folks were interested in what's the potable water source? in the Florida Keys and how do we um, address or think about you know drinking water related to uh, saltwater intrusion and some other things? Good question. So we being an island community we do not have any water of our own in the Keys so we um, pipe it down from our county to the north Miami-Dade County where we have a well field where we pump the water so it starts out with a big 36 inch pipe up in Miami-Dade goes all the way over 130 miles of um, bridges and islands until it gets to Key West and it's about 12 inches. But um, we also monitor that well field very close in Miami-Dade, of course, because that's subject to um, saltwater intrusion. So we're monitoring that very closely. But, and then um, we looked at one other, probably one other thing that goes with that is also our um, wastewater. So we're pretty good sitting with our wastewater. Uh, we just, in the last five years, implemented a billion dollar sewer program. So we're sitting pretty good also in terms of um, sewer and also our drinking water. Okay, hey, great. So, um, so that was one for clarification. There were some other questions uh, that I think you started to address about the coordination between private parcels and fill and those types of things. When you're raising the roadways, what do private landowners do? So you address that toward the end of the discussion. Um, so a couple of broad questions, and then as folks type in, we'll cover them. Um, one of the things that we always talk about in, in planning writ large is the coordination between a hazard mitigation plan and a comprehensive land use plan and a capital plan. Um, so, you know, when I hear both of you present, I hear Olympia talking about sort of a comprehensive planning led process. And when I hear you talk, Rhonda, I hear you talk about more of an engineering capital-led process. And so, uh, Susan and Rhonda, can you talk about some of the, the differences that you might think about between those two things when somebody like engineering or DOT or a utility is driving versus when more of a comprehensive planning process is driving adaptation? Sure, so I can start. So. As I said, we're looking at potentially $2 billion, maybe more, um, for the road elevation project. And the reason it's being led by the engineer, but it seems like an engineering led, and it is engineering led because it's such a big comprehensive, a big plan and a big project, um, it would be difficult to have planning lead that. So we have, so what we've done is, over the last 10 years, we've done a lot of behind the scenes modeling and we have done some updates to our comprehensive plan in anticipation of the big infrastructure plan that's coming. So the planners have been really on board and leading the charge kind of up to this point. Now I see it as going over to the engineering phase for right now, but that doesn't mean the planners aren't involved. They sat in our room when we went over these, um, you know, the, the ranking criteria, they're with us every step of the way behind the scenes, helping us pick out, you know, how the how the ranking criteria should move and then in the next phase, when we come back with some engineering, they're going to help us figure out where, you know, these, how the, um, where the elevation should take place, you know, and that's going to be based on their criteria that they recommend, um, based on rate of growth and and the environment and lots of those things. So even though engineering leads the project, I would almost say that the planners are a co-leader because they're heavily involved all, all along the way. All of our our budget offices also heavily involved because they have to know 
what our needs are so that they can plan in advance to help us pay for it. Thanks. And Susan? Sure. So in Olympia, studying of the effects of sea level rise started in our public works department in our storm and surface water utility because it's responsible for flooding, flooding issues. And we were starting to see um, flooding issues in our downtown. So it started there, um, but then it moved into the planning department as well because we have that connection, required connection between um, land use and, and capital conversations. Um, it's easier as well, I think, for the city of Olympia because we're talking about a pretty small area. We are not talking about a giant um, acres and acres of area that we have to um, protect. We're talking about our downtown. You can sit in City Hall on the third floor and see our downtown. <laughs> you, you can touch it. You know, it's, so it's a little, little easier. And the way that we flood is a le little easier to address um, because we know how Olympia floods, which areas will flood first based on, on elevations, um, things like that. Um, in terms of our, our comprehensive plan, we are really trying to revitalize our downtown. It's a historic area. It's important um, the whole region, not just uh, Olympia citizens, but Thurston County um, and other areas. Um, so we have through the growth management concept, um, started to direct a growth there. We are starting to see um, a lot of five, six story multi-purpose um, buildings, you know, stores on the bottom, things like that. Um, and we know we can protect downtown. Um, and in fact, we have to because we have a treatment plant there. And the idea of relocating that treatment plant is extremely expensive. Um, so we, ha we have to protect and by protecting that treatment plant, we also are protecting the rest of downtown um, with our actions, unless we just built a wall around the treatment plant, but there are other things we can do. Um, I didn't necessarily answer your question <laughs> exactly, um, but we don't have the, the same kinds of issues to deal with um, because you can touch it, you know, you, you, you can touch it um, a little differently. No, that makes sense. And and another thing to follow up to that, I think Rhonda, you touched on it a little bit. Um, you know, these these capital improvement plans aren't just about one set of capital, right? They're about coordinating multiple different types of infrastructures. Um, and so, you know, I know there were some questions and thoughts on timing and, and other things that you all touched on in your presentation. Um, Susan, you addressed a question about, you know, thinking about this in terms of geography, right? It wasn't about right. the system that was vulnerable students soonest, but the general area. Um, right. Can you all talk about how um, you coordinate between the different infrastructure systems, right? So Rhonda, in thinking about that potable water pipeline and distribution system, how do you coordinate, I, I guess, even with Miami-Dade County on thinking about that set of infrastructure? And do you all have any tips for coordinating among the different infrastructure components? So the water pipeline, we actually have a utility in Key West called the Florida Keys Aqueduct Authority. They manage that um, well field in Miami-Dade County. So we really, we work very closely with them. Um, you know, because the county wants to know, want to make sure that we have enough water. And so they're very progressive. They're very, and they're very open and transparent about what they're doing. In fact, they, you know, relocated the well field not too long ago, bit inland to help protect it. But they report continuously on the status of that well field. And we're comfortable with them. You know, they're a really good agency. And other, just kind of other ways that we coordinate with other agencies, like as I said, our countywide roads elevation study that we're underway right now is only an unincorporated Monroe. So we have five municipalities that would like to be doing the same thing, but they don't have the um, you know, level of steps or the funding actually to follow along with us. So we applied for a grant to the state, we're hoping to hear it today, fingers, um, so that if we get the money, we can do these, this 
countywide roads elevation planning for each of the five municipalities. We would do the mobile LIDAR for their roads and get accurate elevation data for all of the roads in these five municipalities, and then work with them on doing this type of planning for them um, in the municipalities. Because if we do just the planning in unincorporated Monroe, we're not gonna be resilient in the Keys we're gonna be only half resilient in the Keys and there's still gonna be neighborhoods that are going to go underwater and people that are gonna be affected. And the real reason, you know, beyond, you know, making sure that our residents are prepared is we're gonna to need to walk hand in hand when we go to the halls of our state capital, Tallahassee and also DC, when we're gonna be looking for, we're looking, gonna look for big dollars here. We wanna make sure that our partners in our municipalities are walking hand in hand with us. So that's why we're working really hard to try to catch up these municipalities so that we're all at the same level so that you know islands you know the water knows no boundary it's going to go everywhere and so we need to make sure that we're all working together to prepare resilient overall Florida Keys. So in, sure <laughs> so in terms of the city of Olympia city of Olympia owned infrastructure we were sitting at the table I mean it, the city is responsible for roads um, we don't have any state roads in this area uh, things like that so we've, we're there um, Port of Olympia and the Law Clean Water Alliance were partners in the sea level rise response plan um, because they wanted to coordinate their efforts have those conversations with the city um, ultimately some of the um, protection measures that they need to do will be funded solely by themselves, just like some may be funded solely by the city of Olympia, depending on, on the asset and how it's being protected, things like that. So they were sitting at the table. Um, state of Washington, as I mentioned in the presentation, they own um, and are responsible for Capital Lake. So the coordination with the uh, state of Washington, uh, we need to continue with that. <clears throat> Flooding um, from Capital Lake is where we are most vulnerable. Um, so we need to work with the state of Washington to make sure um, that we partner on protection measures um, because again, that's the, the first area that we need to protect. So we've been coordinating with the state on those issues. Um, we've invited them to sit at the table as we continue implementation conversations, but it's about bringing, bringing folks into the room. Um, we do have at least one power station located downtown in the, our area is served by an investor-owned um, electric company, so we need to also coordinate with them. But they, of course, need to protect their power station because it serves you know, the citizens of Olympia. Um, so they have a reason to participate and understand flooding um, to their facility. So, Rhonda, we've got a couple questions here um, that I'll try and group, hopefully, in, into one. So. Um, people picked up on the we, you know, you sort of just went through a multi-billion-dollar sewer program, and thinking about obligating another multi-billion-dollar roadway program, right? What are what's the financing mix of that, right? To how long are those obligations to finance some of those improvements? And I mean, if you can talk a little bit about your experience with the sewer program and what you might have learned from that. To, to take into the roadway program in, fi in financing, you know, billions of dollars of improvements, right? How do we think about that, that billion with a B number? I know, it's such big numbers for our little tiny county. But, so we did go through the last decade with the sewer program and really what we did was um, our, obviously a partnership. So that was federal funds was, a, I'm not quite as sure about the third was a third and then the county funds and then the residents had the fund apportion you know a portion so it was 30 30 30 it wasn't quite that way but that worked well you know then they could set up assessments we just you know i call them taxes but we set up assessments to pay for the residents fund and so when you have a house now they have like a i think it's 30 year payment you know to pay down that fund and so that worked really well so that was one billion now we're looking at two billion for roads elevation and just to get us through 2045. So we're doubling it, it's a lot of money. Um, and as I said, half of the roads are gonna be subject to sea level rise by 2045 and the other half aren't. So where we find ourselves right now, we're, we did get caught a little bit. So we've, you know, we've been 
doing going along our merry way and we're underway with um building a courthouse and libraries and fire stations and we're kind of all of our capital funds now are actually tied up for the next five years so we have two pilot road elevation projects that were already designed and they're ready to build and just let me tell you, they'll, um, you know, they're expensive. The one is 14 million for, uh, you know, a small neighborhood, and the other one is 8 million, and so that's a lot of money. That's a library, and so we're not there yet. So what we did was actually just a month ago, we hosted a big workshop with our county commissions, and we said, look, we're not going to have enough money. We don't nowhere near are we going to have two billion dollars to for this road elevation program. So we're either going to have to identify new sources of funding or we're not going to have a roads elevation program and the keys are going to be inundated with sea level rise. So they looked at new sources of funds. So we already have what's called the tourist tax, which is an additional penny sales tax that goes towards um, county projects. But a lot of those projects are already underway, like the libraries and courthouses and stuff like that. So even if we extend that, it's not going to help us a lot with new resilience projects. So we're looking at a potential new penny for that. That would bring about 30 million a year, still not enough. We're looking at a countywide utility tax. You're probably more familiar with it being called a stormwater utility. Um, a lot of communities have that. Well, lo and behold, we don't. We should have had it a long time ago. So we're looking at a countywide, I call it a flood mitigation fee, countywide where everybody would pay. And then finally, we're looking at um, a um, residence assessment. So it's like we had assessments set up to pay down their um, sewer fee <laughs> assessment set up. So when our neighborhood does get a road elevation, part of that project, you know, part of the cost will be to them and then they'll have a, an assessment. And then we're hoping, oh, you know, the big costs are gonna, you know, that's gonna be the county's portion, you know, through a stormwater utility or, you know, the flood mitigation utility. The residence portion is gonna be through assessments and then the remainder is gonna be hopefully, you know, federal and state grants we're awful hopeful but we're scaring them already we heard at our state capital because we're out in the forefront and so there's nobody else asking for you know big dollars for road elevation projects yet. so when we put our first grant in um, a couple months ago i think we shocked them up in tallahassee uh, because they weren't used to this so you know that's part of our project we have to now you know teach people in tallahassee and in dc you're going to see a lot of these so it looks expensive you know we were looking at a 21 million dollars for just for 200 homes and in, in one neighborhood that's expensive to raise you know um but if we don't do it if we don't you know educate the people at state and federal dc level um those funds may be slow in coming if, if at all so we really got our work cut out for us but you know we're looking for that whole partnership it's going to have to be a partnership because the federal government is not going to pay it all, state government's not going to pay it all. So the county has to look up. We all have to be in this together. How that split ends up being um, is going to be determined. And so thinking about thinking about the scope and size of these problems, right? Whether we're talking about Olympia or whether we're talking about the entirety of Monroe County, you know, one of the things, one of the places planners often get a question, right, is, you know, we can finance all of it or we can think about how to plan to densify and, you know, over time, let some areas go, right? And, and think about how and where people are moving and people are living. So, how are you all engaging in whether you call that a retreat conversation or, or thinking about places that, you know, are going to have a limited time and a limited utility, you know, how do we move those places away from danger over time or away from inundation, right? How do we engage that conversation in both Washington State and in Monroe County? Maybe I'll start and start by saying we are not retreating from downtown Olympia. Um, in the beginning, as, as we were starting to have conversations with our community, we did have some folks suggesting retreat. But again, downtown is our core. Our comprehensive plan is um, addressing our downtown, revitalizing it. We have a very expensive treatment plant that's located downtown. Protecting that helps to protect the remaining portions of damage. Retreat simply isn't on the table um, at this point in time. We think we can protect downtown Olympia um, up to 68 inches of sea level rise. 
Does that mean the city of Olympia looks exactly the same as it does right now? No, there may be some limited areas of retreat. I showed a map that had um, some property that was on the water side of the line of protection. Um, that's an example of a small area that over time, 50, 60 years, something like that may not look the same. Maybe it becomes a public park, um, something like that. So we're not having those conversations um, at the City of Olympia. So I'll turn it over, <laughs> Rhonda. You may have to. <laughs> so, like I said, 300 miles of roads, um, you know, even just to get us through 2045 is going to be $2 billion. So I'm not sure I'd want to be a county commissioner right now in the Keys because they're going to really have a lot of decisions to make. It's whether, you know, are, are we going to be able to raise the money to raise all the roads? Probably not. That's, that's, that's an awful lot of money. And we have roads, coastal roads. You know, like there's one in the lower keys, I won't say the island, but it's about three miles long, goes down the coast, and it goes out to an area where perhaps maybe a dozen or 15 homes are, very nice homes. Um, but that road is going to be underwater if we don't do something by the year 2045. And to elevate a three-mile section of road um, it could cost tens of millions of dollars. Are we going to spend tens of millions of dollars on that road to elevate it so that 15 homes are, you know, at the end could could be? Probably not. So that's when we have to make decisions. Well, what are we going to do? We're just going to maintain it as best we can. And then as it starts, you know, gets going underwater during these fall king tides, what are we going to do? Um, we might not do any. That's where the planners are going to have to come in and help us decide what we're going to do. Are we going to set up policies for road abandonment? Are we going to set up policies where we're just going to maintain the road as is? And if it goes underwater, so be it. And what does that mean in terms of our what type of amendments we need for a comprehensive plan? Or are we going to buy out those properties? Those are all types of decisions that our planners are going to help us make really based on the direction that our county commissioners are going to give us in terms of what they're willing to move forward with in terms of getting funding from the county and from residents because we're definitely not going to get enough from the federal go state government. And so when you put all that together here in the next year, you're going to see some really interesting discussions. And there may be some areas. And we've I've even talked to a Oh, I think Rhonda throws it. <laughs> yes. Never know if it's myself or someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, the, the one thing I'll add as well um, for communities is to think about the cost of retreat. There are costs associated with retreat. Um, our downtown has potential sources of pollution that would have to be abated, things like that, there, there are costs. Um, so when you're weighing protection retreat, um, keeping, the, keeping in mind those costs can be important too, as, you, as you're making decisions. It yeah, seems so like soon. a political and a, a planning issue. That's, I'm, that's the <laughs> takeaway actually that I'm getting from both of you. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I was gonna. I was gonna actually move on because I know we're we're a little bit short on time, time and yeah. I want to engage a conversation. So, um, a lot of a lot of what we talk about when we talk about planning is you know considering sea level rise, and it's one thing to consider sea level rise, and it's one thing for that consideration to make a substantive difference in the decisions that would have actually happened anyway, right? Consideration or not. So, um, Susan, I guess in, in your view in, in Olympia, um, is sea level rise moving some projects up the priority list, right? Is, or is everything kind of, you're, or is everything staying the same in terms of priority, right? How, how much impact is incorporating sea level and sea level change having on capital plan and capital planning decisions? So my first thought on that is tied to our um, storm and surface water utility. So our storm and surface water utility has been focusing in on um, our outfalls into Capital Lake in Bud Inlet. And we have just about completed um, putting in tide gates 
um, to keep water from coming back in and flooding downtown. So we've made those decisions. Um, some of that is associated with sea level rise. We're, we're having more flooding associated with sea level rise. Um, but at this point in time, we haven't made any capital investments in a different way. Um, our parks department does have plans to elevate some of their boardwalk. It's getting old um, anyway, so there's some maintenance work and replacement work that they have to do uh, regardless. So they will put to um, take into consideration sea level rise when they make those, those decisions. Um, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the lot Clean Water Alliance, but they are making changes um, to their treatment plant um, to address sea level rise, you know, raising some infrastructure, things like that. They have been. Thanks. Hi, Rhonda. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. We Rhonda, had uh, electricity go out. <laughs> the, the, the question that Susan was just addressing was, um, you know, in thinking about considering sea level rise in the capital plan, and you engage this right in thinking about the county who's already appropriated libraries and fire departments and buildings, right? Um, has the incorporation of sea level rise in that capital planning approach raised the priority of, you know, whether whether they are, you know, critical facilities or um, other infrastructures, right? Has that the incorporation of those criteria, has it pushed some projects up the list that might have been down at the bottom five years ago, right? How is sea level rise making sort of a, a tangible difference in that capital planning prioritization process? So that's actually where we are right now. So we, unfortunately, we, you know, we've had some really big um, other projects like a big courthouse and libraries and fire stations all underway here over the last several years. And so those are all in the middle here they've got another two or three years to go before they're done so we kind of find ourselves now at a crux where we're finishing out some of these older projects and you know getting ready to, we're not ready to start elevating the roads yet because we don't have an identified funding source so that's why we're working now um, closely to identify new funding sources because um, we're just kind of in that crux where we're still finishing up the older stuff and it's it's interesting. We probably could have planned a little bit better, but you know, we didn't know we were going to face two billion dollars in road elevation um, fees. And so, you know, you do the best you can. At least we are where we are now, and we're planning for new sources of funding to move forward. So, Nicole, I think that's <laughs> all the time we have, right? We yeah. are running up against two thirty. We are, and first of all, before it, before everybody jumps off, I want to thank both of our speakers, Susan and Rhonda, and I definitely want to thank APA Ohio and the Hazard Division for sponsoring. Thank you, Christine at APA Ohio for helping us put these up together. But also, before we go, if you have a quick chance to put something in the chat or send an email to me or to Matt about other sea level rise and planning related issues you might be interested in. We've completed this webinar series. We're at number four and we would be willing to put on more, consider them, but these were the four we thought would be the best to start off to provide to all of you. So if there are other ones, please put them either in, like I said, the chat, send an email or the other is to put that in your survey response and please give us feedback about this these webinars it really helps us to clarify what to do and what information to offer to everybody uh, with that i think we are out of time and i want to thank matt for being my co-host with all of these and to say good luck and goodbye to everybody and we hope we'll see you again soon thank you very much happy holidays everyone thank you